Okay, we're going to show you sample preparation for uh, ASTM D5887, ASTM D6766. It's uh, flux with uh, for GCL. So you have the GCL coupon. Uh, the trick is to take that coupon and uh, prepare it into a uh, specimen. This specimen needs to be uh, 100 millimeters. You can cut that out with a steel rule die, or we like these Maverick dies, which are uh, extractable. It extracts us for it. The trick is to, around the base of the die, is to put a little water so you can get a little containment of the clay within the, uh, the, the specimen. So here we have it set up. You can see the, the die was punched. It now will uh, pop out with this cardboard on the back. So you have your sample. And now what you need to do with this sample is uh, make your sandwich. You start with a uh, platen. This is the lower platen for the flux apparatus. Uh, you then need to go with a uh, porous stone. The, on top of the porous stone has to be a uh, filter paper. Uh, it helps a little bit if you uh, saturate things. Filter paper will adhere. You then need to go with the uh, GCL specimen. And then uh, repeat with filter paper and now the porous stone. So this is your sandwich. Unfortunately, what you have to do is you have to make sure that there's no end run around here. So typically you take a dental tool and uh, cut out any fibers and then subsequently putty this with some uh, supplemental uh, clay. You don't want to get it too much in the porous stone, but you want to uh, fill this in so that you're, uh, you're not having any sidewall leakage. This is very important in the preparation procedure. You'll then place this on the bottom cap and get ready for uh, running your equipment. I'll show you this uh, when we move into the hydraulics laboratory. But a very important thing is when you have uh, needle punch non-woven textiles involved, these low denier fibers can communicate between the upper and lower textiles, and you have to assure that that does not happen. So this is specimen preparation. Okay, here we're now in the hydraulics lab of GSI, and we're going to uh, set up the uh, flux specimens uh, with the, from the GCLs. We showed you the sample preparation and we had this sandwich made. This whole system will be flipped over and then placed on the lower platen. We then need to uh, strap a, a latex, um, a flexible membrane around this entire uh, specimen setup. And that's done, it takes a little while with a little practice. A little bit of vacuum grease, very little, around the outside perimeter. We take the O-rings and adhere them to the uh, platens, top and bottom, and then you'll hook this up. But this is the uh, specimen preparation uh, prior to assembling the cell. So uh, we go from outside preparation to assembling this, and now we'll put the jacket on, which is on the outside this housing on the outside. You then need to put a top on. And then this is uh, harnessed or strapped with these rods, top and bottom. This is a, a flex wall permeometer by Troutwine. Uh, Steve Troutwine was an old classmate of mine at Drexel. Uh, and this is really fantastic equipment. Uh, it, very easy to work with and uh, is extremely rugged. Okay, the cell has been assembled now. Uh, everything is tightened down and it's uh, watertight. What you need to do is fill the, the chamber 
the annulus, uh, the jacket around the uh, specimen. You uh, fill this with tap water. You have to uh, place a vent in the top of it to let the air escape. Uh, we place the line into the fill chamber and you can see the water coming up and it's flooding the outside of the, uh, the flex wall uh, specimen that's inside of it. You'll wait until the water rises and takes all the air out of the specimen. Okay, we're ready to hook it up to the apparatus now. We're uh, fortunate here at GSI to have actually three individual setups. This setup here is uh, to this particular cell. So uh, what we need to do first is uh, switch over from the uh, fill the chamber to uh, the actual chamber control, which is uh, here. So that's important. This uh, burette will control the, uh, the chamber. Um, the next thing you need to do is to fill the entrance and the exit, okay, which are each controlled through these valves. So this will be the the influent line and this will be the effluent line. You have this entire device which is uh, set up obviously for power for the pressure transducer. You have uh, a compressor which is feeding this uh, compressed air. You have a vacuum system for uh, saturating the uh, sample and you also are feeding uh, the lines with distilled deionized water, which is also de-aired. Uh, that's why it's in a de-aired column. So uh, you have an influent and an effluent line uh, and a, a chamber control. Each one of those burettes isolate each one of those regions. Um, this is shown on a, a working diagram and uh, we'll back saturate and set things up next. Okay, I'm giving you first-hand knowledge of this, uh, how the plumbing is set up on this. So this is the underside of the cell. You see that these are two valves here. The one valve, this red one, goes to the underside of the platen. There's a redundant red one over here, which is also to the underside of the platen. This black valve over here, which will go to the, uh, the top, this upper platen, which is on top of the specimen. So it's very important to understand this uh, valving configuration. These two red valves, or the two center valves, they're black on the other uh, cell, but these two red uh, controls will uh, go to the underside of this cell. This is set up in the trout wine apparatus uh, very nicely so you don't get confused. And it's a series of redundant valves so that you can uh, de-air the specimen, which is critically important to us. So it's imperative you know the uh, workings of these uh, burettes. There's an inside and outside annulus uh, to this. So uh, you can use the pipette inside or the annulus outside, which is in uh, graduations. You will have to be able to isolate and to vent this. So uh, the workings of it is critically important, okay? So let's introduce water into this. You do that by shutting the valve. This will shut the line to the cell off. You then uh, will vent this, which will take the pressure off of it. And now you're going to introduce water into it. You'll see that both the uh, pipette and the annulus are rising. We'll rise water up to it to about this level. and then subsequently shut the water off. You can drain this water if you wish, and uh, this drain, that's accomplished by having the vent on and then placing things to drain so you can drain. You have total control of this uh, burette or the annulus. You can just do the burette alone uh, if you want, and you can see that it drains much quicker. But this gives you an idea of how to control. You can have both of them uh, reacting at one time, but this is the control of this. 
to now put this back online after you've changed the water level. You're not consuming any uh, very much water uh, in the chamber. That's why I demonstrated with this. Uh, you would move the, the line to pressure and then subsequently put the valve back on and uh, you'd have things ready. You'd be exerting the, the pressure off of your uh, regulator, which is uh, recorded on this, and this is how you would control it. So that's how you uh, introduce water into the burette or the, the pipette and the annulus. Okay, now you're ready to uh, saturate the uh, specimen. Uh, unfortunately, you have to drive out all the air which is inside the specimen. So the way of doing that is you set up the cell pressure to 15 PSI. You then turn on the bridge between the inflow and outflow. And now you would like to introduce 10 PSI to uh, the inflow and outflow. Um, it's very important that you don't, uh, that, you, that you have a greater pressure on the cell than you uh, have on the inflow and outflow. For saturation, you have the bridge on. If you do not have that, you'll blow a balloon, you'll blow up the sample. So uh, it's critical to keep that 5 PSI differential. So now you're set up with 15 PSI in the uh, chamber. 10 PSI bridged over the inflow outflow and now what you'll do is you'll turn on the uh, burettes and then you'll turn on the cell. This is from the bottom, this is from the top to let the air out and here you'll have the joint. You see the water coming out, you'll see a lot of bubbles coming out as well. So this will take some time to saturate things and uh, you do it under these conditions of a 5 PSI differential. Okay, so we're finally there. Uh, we have the uh, cell at 80 PSI. We have the bridge on between the inflow and the outflow, and we have each one of those at uh, 75 PSI. So uh, we're set up. Now what we have to do is wait. We have to wait for 48 hours uh, to let this uh, system equilibrate before we drive it. Okay, so uh, we'll be back in uh, two days to uh, talk with you and let this thing equilibrate prior to, uh, you know, running the sample. Okay, it's two days later now, and what we have is the uh, sample that's set up. We're now ready to drive this, and what, how we need to drive it is with a pressure differential. We're going to set up the... Uh, the influent line at 77 PSI and the effluent line at 75. That 2 PSI differential will be enough to drive the uh, specimen. We'll see water leaving this uh, burette and increasing in the, the other one. To do that you have to turn the, uh, the bridge off and then increase the pressure in the effluent line um, 2 PSI. We've done that now and now you'll see the pressure rise in uh, the effluent line and the, the, the volume decrease in this line. You will now run the specimen and what you're looking for is uh, you'll run it over a period of 8 um, hours to maybe even up to 40 hours. Uh, what you're looking for is the ratio from inflow to outflow to be between 0.75 and 1.25. You'd really like it to be very close to one. In addition to that, you should see no significant trends in the, uh, the data, the, uh, the trend over time. And this trend, you can't see an up or down trend in flow over three consecutive readings. Obviously, the closer to inflow to outflow, the better, but uh, you'll just drive the test into there. Okay, uh, now we'll, uh, we'll run the test for the next 8 to 40 hours, and then I'll show you the test uh, specimen disassemble. Okay, so now you're pressurizing the top with air, 
you have this connected to the drain and you're subsequently uh, taking the, uh, the fluid out of the cell. Okay, the, uh, now we're driving air out so everything is fine. It's uh, no longer water in the cell and now we can disassemble the cell. Okay, the big emphasis now is this specimen. You need the thickness of this specimen, the clay component of the specimen, uh, for calculations. So what you need to do is you need to get into uh, the specimen uh, post-test which is important. So you're disassembling the material and this GCL is strapped in between the two uh, textiles and you have to break this off very gently. Okay, you're going to need the thickness of the clay uh, with inside the GCL for some calculations uh, for the, the flux to permeability. And the way you do that is you've uh, sectioned the, uh, the specimen. You can see I've cut it in half. And then subsequently the clay component, you have to leave the textiles out. So in this particular case, it's about 0.18 inches in uh, thickness after the test. And you'll need this uh, dimension to uh, change flux into permeability of centimeters per second. Okay, this is ASTM D5887. Uh, we also can run uh, a flux with uh, salt water, and that's ASTM D6766. The only difference in the test, instead of driving it with still, distilled deionized water, you uh, drive it with uh, salt water, and this uh, salt water of a known molarity, and these are the ports. You connect one to the influent and the other one to the effluent, and otherwise it's the exact same procedure uh, for 5887 as it is for 6766. Okay, signing out from GSI, this has been uh, Index Flux for uh, GRI specification GCL3.